Sunny Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Jennifer Holmans. I'm the founder and director of this. Not working. Oh, I can stand. Is that better? So welcome. I'm uh, Jennifer Holmans. I'm the founder and director of the Center for Ballet and the Arts, and I'm here to welcome you to this evening about Nijinsky's Diaries and the, in conjunction with the Brooklyn Academy of Music's production of Letter to a Man. First, I'm going to take very short time in thanks. I'm going to thank uh, Paul Giamatti, our panelists, all of them, who I will introduce to you in a moment, NYU, the Mellon Foundation, and our colleagues at BAM for helping us to arrange this event. The evening will go as follows, just so you know. Paul Giamatti will be reading from the diaries of Nijinsky. Then we will pause and we will reset for a moment for a panel of experts to discuss the diaries and the production at BAM, including Joan Acachella, whose edited version of the diaries we are using here tonight, and I can highly recommend to you all. Larry Wolf, a scholar of Central European history and culture, and the writer Daryl Pinckney, who also worked on the BAM production. Is it not working? Fuzzy. Okay. So is this better? <laughs> I, I don't know what else to do. I could shout. Uh, before we begin, I'm going to just briefly set the scene, and Joan is going to talk to us more about the scene later. Our subject here tonight is Václav Nijinsky, the man and the diaries. Nijinsky was born in Kiev around 1889. His parents were Polish itinerant dancers. Václav actually made his de debut in a circus when he was seven. His father then left the family. His mother settled in St. Petersburg and enrolled Václav and his sister Bonislava, also an important choreographer and dancer at the Imperial Theater School. Václav became a dancer, and in the early years of the 20th century, joined the impresario Sergio Diaghilev and his now legendary Ballet Russe. They left Russia before the war and before the revolution for Europe, and neither one of them ever returned to live there again. They were also lovers, as well as collaborators. In the years to come, Nijinsky, of course, became the most celebrated dancer and choreographer in Western Europe, I think it's fair to argue. With Diaghilev's company, he invented a really sort of new and strange kind of dance, a far cry from the fairy tale dances that had preceded it. Afternoon of a Fawn, which he choreographed and danced in, ended with him masturbating on stage. Rite of Spring enacted a brutal ritual sacrifice of the death of a virgin maiden. So these are really life-changing ballets. I am accused, he said proudly, of a crime against grace. There were, of course, many other dances, too. Then in 1919, at the age of 29, he began a descent into madness from which he would never recover. He also, at the same time, began to write his diary, and including the letter to a man addressed to Serge Diaghilev. At the same time, and in fact on the same day, he performed his last dance, which was a solo dance. And here's how it went. He appeared in simple, loose-fitting pants and a shirt with sandals, very plainly dressed. He placed a chair in the center of the room and sat stoically staring at the fashionably dressed audience while the pianist played uncomfortably on because Nijinsky wasn't moving. He was just sitting there, and he sat there for quite a long time. Finally, in silence, he took two bolsters of fabric one black and one white, and he unrolled them on the stage into a large cross. He stood at its head with his arms open, Christ-like, and said, now I will dance the war, the war you did not prevent and are also responsible for. 
This was the last dance that Nijinsky ever performed. He was subsequently institutionalized, and he died in 1950. So we have the diaries to talk about tonight. The diaries survive him as a document of madness, his madness, and the sign of a man who was a dancer and a revolutionary maker of dances. So now I will welcome Paul Giamatti to do two readings from the diaries and to finish with a reading of the letter to a man to Serge Diaghilev. Thank you very much. Paul, welcome. After I have finished this book, I will not live as I did before. I want to write about death and therefore any fresh impressions. I call fresh impressions when a man writes about things he has experienced. I will write about everything I have experienced. I want to experience things. I'm a man in death. I am not God. I am not man. I am a beast and a predator. I want to make love to prostitutes. I want to live like an unnecessary man. I know that God wants this, and therefore, I will live that way. I will live that way until he stops me. I will gamble on the stock exchange because I want to do so at other people's expense. I am an evil man. I do not love anyone. I wish harm to everyone and good to myself. I'm an egoist. I am not God. I am a beast, a predator. I will practice masturbation and spiritualism. I will eat everyone I can get hold of. I will stop at nothing. I will make love to my wife's mother and my child. I will weep, but I will do everything God commands me to. And I know that everyone will be afraid of me and will commit me to a lunatic asylum, but I don't care. I'm not afraid of anything. I want death. I will blow my brains out if God wants it. I will be ready for anything. I know that God wants all this for the improvement of life, and therefore I will be his instrument. It's past one o'clock, I'm still not asleep. I know that people must work in the daytime, but I work at night. I know that tomorrow I will have red eyes. My wife's mother will be afraid because she will think that I am mad. I hope that I will be committed to a lunatic asylum. I will rejoice at this event because I like to tyrannize everyone. I take delight in tyrannizing. Tyranny is familiar to me. I used to know a dog named Citra. That dog was good. I spoiled it. I taught it to masturbate against my leg. I taught it to come against my leg. I like that dog. I did all these things when I was a kid. I also did what the dog did, but with my hand. I came at the same time as the dog. I know that many girls and women make love to animals in this way. I know that my maid, Louise, does this with cats. I know that my cook does this with cats. I know that everyone does this sort of thing. I know that all small dogs are spoiled. I know one Hungarian family where the daughter did this with a gorilla. The gorilla bit her in the place where it was screwing her. See, the ape was angry because the woman failed to understand it. Apes are stupid animals, and the woman was trying to fool the gorilla, so the gorilla bit her, and she died in horrible agony. I know that many women put all kinds of sweet things inside themselves so that animals will lick them. I know women who have had animals licking them. I know people who lick. I used to lick my wife. I wept, but I licked. I know terrible things because I learned them from Diaghilev. Diaghilev taught me everything. I was young and I did stupid things, but I do not want to practice these things anymore. I know what all this leads to. I have seen women who get screwed by men several times in a row. I myself used to screw my wife as many as uh, five times a day. I know what all this leads to. I do not want to do these things anymore. I know that many doctors prescribe this. According to them, a man must screw his wife every day. 
I know that everyone believes it. I know there are doctors who prescribe it as an essential thing for a man to make love to a woman for. Without that, it is not possible to exist. I know that people do this only because they have a great deal of lust. I know many poems about lust. Lust is a terrible thing. I know that the clergy practices the same sort of thing. I know that the church does not forbid lascivious activities. I know a case where my wife and her maid had to go to confession to say that they were almost raped in the basement of a London church. I've forgotten the name of the church. I'll give it later. I'll ask my wife. I want to screw her in order to have a child and not because of lust. I do not want to feel lust. I do not like the feeling of lust. I want to live. I will feel lust because God will want it. My corns disappeared. I noticed today that I had no corns, but my toes are short and do not have a nice shape. I noticed that my toes had no nerves. I realized that our whole life is regeneration. I realized that if people went on living in this way, they would have no toes. I realized that people did not think about what they were doing. I know that the earth regenerates itself, and I realize that people contribute to its regeneration. I noticed that the earth is becoming extinguished and that all life is becoming extinguished with it. I realized that the oil uh, that is pumped out of the earth and gave heat to the earth and that coal is what had burned up inside the earth. I realized that without burning, there would be no life. I realized that we needed the heat of the earth, that the life of the earth was its heat. I realized that people abused the practice of pumping oil and petroleum out of the earth. I realized that people did not understand the meaning of life. Now, I know that it's difficult to live without oil and petroleum. I know that people need coal. I know that uh, precious stones are burnt out and decomposed elements. I know that water is the remains of earth and air. I know that the moon is covered with water. I know that astronomers have seen canals. And I understand the meaning of canals. I know that people use the canals as a means of escape. I will be a fish and not a man if people do not help me. But I realize that the earth is becoming extinguished. Now, I know that the earth used to be a sun. I know what the sun is. The sun is fire. And people think that life depends on the sun. I know that life depends on people. I know what life is. I know what death is. The sun is reason. The intellect is an extinguished sun that is decomposing. I know that decomposition destroys life. I know that the earth is being covered with the decomposed matter, and I know that people abuse decomposition. Scientists are covering the earth all the time. The earth is suffocating. There's not enough air for it. Earthquakes are due to the shaking of the earth's entrails. The earth's entrails are mine. I tremble when I am not understood. I feel a lot, and therefore I live within me. The fire is never extinguished. I live with God. People do not understand me. I came here to help. I want paradise on earth. Today there is hell on earth. Hell is when people quarrel. Yesterday I quarreled with my wife for her own improvement. I was not angry. I made her angry, not out of anger, but in order to kindle in her a love for me. I want to kindle the earth and people and not extinguish them. Scientists extinguish the earth and human love. I know that it is inconvenient to write in this notebook, but I'm writing in it because I think it's a pity to use up the paper. For I know that if men had pity for each other, life would last longer. 
Now, I know many people will tell me it's not important to live for a long time. They will say, life will be long enough for me, but after all, that phrase speaks of death. People do not like children. People think that their children are not them. People think that children are necessary in order to have more soldiers. People kill children and cover the earth with ash. Ash is harmful to the earth. People say that ash is good for the earth. I know that when the earth is covered with ash, it suffocates. I know it needs life. I'm a Russian, and therefore I know what earth is. I do not know how to plow, but I know that the earth glows. Without its warmth, there would be no bread. People think they must burn the bones of the dead in order to fertilize soil. I will say that this is bad because the earth is made fertile by warmth and not by ash. I realize that the earth is putrefaction. I know that putrefaction is a good thing. I know that without putrefaction, there would be no bread. I know that putrefaction covers the earth and in this way destroys the earth's heat. And I realize that people think that one must eat a lot. I consider food a habit. I know that man is by nature very strong. I know that people weaken him because they take no care of his life. I know that people must live, and therefore I want to explain to scientists. I know that many scientists will laugh, but I understand the meaning of this laughter. I do not want laughter. I want love. Love is life, and laughter is death. I like laughing when God wills it so. Now, I know many people will say, why is Nijinsky always talking about God? He's mad. We know he's a dancer and nothing else. I understand all those sneers. Those sneers do not annoy me. I weep and weep. I know that many people will say that uh, Nijinsky is a crybaby. I know what a crybaby is. I'm not a crybaby. I'm not a dying man. I'm alive, and therefore I suffer. My tears rarely flow. I weep in my heart. I know what a crybaby is. People call crybabies those who have weak nerves. I know what nerves are because I was nervous. I've turned off the electric light because I want, I want to economize. I've understood the meaning of economy. I do not mind spending the money, but I do mind spending energy. I've realized that without energy, there would be no life. I realize the meaning of the earth, which is being extinguished, and therefore I want to give people an idea of how it would be possible to obtain electricity without coal. Coal is essential for the heat of the earth, and therefore I do not want to dig out coal. I call you by name because you cannot be called by your name. I'm not writing to you quickly because I don't want you to think I'm nervous. I'm not a nervous man. I'm able to write calmly. I like writing. I do not like writing fine phrases. I never learned to write fine phrases. I want to write down thoughts. I need thought. I'm not afraid of you. I know you hate me. I love you as a human being. I do not want to work with you. I want to tell you one thing. I work a lot. I'm not dead. I'm alive. Within me lives God. I live in God. God lives in me. I'm very busy working on dances. My dances are making progress. I write well, but I do not know how to write fine phrases. You like fine phrases. You organize troops. I do not organize troops. I'm not a corpse. I'm a living person. You're a dead person because your aims are dead. I've not called you friend because I know that you are my enemy. I am not your enemy. An enemy is not God. God's not an enemy. Enemies seek death. I seek life. I have love. You have spite. 
I am not a predatory beast. You are a predatory beast. Predatory beasts do not like people. I like people. Dostoevsky liked people. I'm not an idiot. I'm a human being. I am an idiot. Dostoevsky is an idiot. You thought I was stupid? I thought you were stupid. We thought we were stupid. Well, I, I don't want it to climb. I don't like to climb to you. You like people bowing down to you. I like people bowing down to me. You revile those who bow down. I like those who bow down. I call for declensions. You frighten declensions. My declension is a declension. I don't want your smile, for it smells of death. I am not death, and I don't smile. I don't write in order to have a laugh. I write in order to weep. I'm a man with feeling and reason. You're a man with intelligence and without feeling. Your feeling is evil. My feeling is good. You want to destroy me? I want to save you. I like you. You don't like me. I wish you well. You wish me ill. I know your tricks. I pretended to be nervous. I pretended to be stupid. I was not a kid. I was God. I am God within yourself. You are a beast, but I am love. You do not love those people now. I love those people, everyone now. Don't think I don't listen. I am not yours. You are not mine. I love you now. I love you always. I am yours. I am my own. You are mine. I like declining you. I like declining myself. I am yours. I am my own. You are mine. I am God. You have forgotten that God is. I have forgotten that God is. You are within me. I am within you. You are mine, and I am yours. You are the one who wants death. You are the one who loves death. I love, love, love. I am love, but you are death. You are afraid of death, of death. I love, I love, I love. You are death, but I am blood. Your blood is not love. I love you. You, I am not blood, but I am the spirit I am the blood and the spirit in you. I am love. I am love. You don't want to live with me? I wish you well. You are mine. You are mine. I am yours. I am yours. I love writing with a pen. I write. I write. You do not write. You tell a write. You are a telegram. I am a letter. You're a machine. I am love. You are a woodpecker. I am a woodpecker. You reach manhood, I reach manhood. You are a mouge, I am of mouge, we are of mougie, you are of mougie. You are a male, I am a male, we are males, you are males. Your mouge is not my mouge. You are a, a of mouge, I am a of mouge. You are a male, I am not yours. Yours is he, but mine is not you. You are yours, but I am he. He is mine, he is not yours. I want to tell you that you cannot be so. I want to tell you that you cannot be so. I am yours. You are mine. We are we. We are not you. We are we. We are not you. You are the one who calls for death. You are the one who calls for death. I am yours, but you are not mine. Mine is one's own, but one's own is not yours. You're a woodpecker. I am not a woodpecker. You knock and I knock. Your knock is your knock, but mine is a knock. Knock, knock, knock. In a knock, there is a knock. I am a knock, but I do not knock. You knock, knock, knock. I knock, knock, knock. I'm knocking in your soul. You knock in your brain. I love you, my knock. I am a knock, a knock, but you are not a knock. I want to knock within the knock. You knock in the brain. In the brain. I want to knock for you, knock, knock, knock. A knock is a cockerel. <laughs> I am a cockerel, but not a cockerel. You or a cockerel, but not a cockerel. I sing, 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 you sing, sing, sing. I drink, drink, drink. You drink, drink, drink. I'm a cockerel, a cockerel, a cockerel. I'm a cockerel, a cockerel, a cockerel. My cockerel sings, sings your cockerel drinks, drinks. I am a cockerel, but you are not mine. I am a cockerel, but you are not yours. We sing. In the cockerel, I sing without the cockerel. We sing of the cockerel, I sing without cockerel. Sing, sing, sing cockerel, sing cockerel. Your cockerel will die, will die. I sing, I sing, I will die, I will die. I sing, I sing, I will die, I will die. You will die without the cockerel. I will die with the cockerel. Your cockerel is death, is death. My cockerel is life, is life. I love you. I love you, Cockrell. 
you sing and I sing, we sing, but I am not yours. I sing well, you sing badly. I sing, 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 you sing, 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 we sing, but I am not yours. You are not mine and I am not yours. You do not love me, one's own. I love you not, one's own. You are not mine and I am not yours. We are yours. You are not theirs. I am yours, but you are not mine. Mine is yours. Mine is yours. Poro, 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 talk. I, poro, poro. I, poro, poro. I, poro, poro, poro. You, poro, shh. Ha, you porosh, I porosh, you porosh, I am talk, but you are talk, 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 poroshok. I am porosh, but you are oshok. I am poshok, but you are dushok. I am tushok, but you are toshok. We in prok are poroshok. I am porosh, but you are oshok. Ha <laughs> ha, we make a noise, we make a noise. You are not noise, but I am noise. I am young, but you are old. We are death, but I am young. Lolo is life, but not a sledgehammer. I am a sledgehammer, but not a hammer. You are talk, and I am talk. I am talk, talk, talk. Talk, 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 not talk. We are talk, talk, talk. You are not talk, but I am talk. I am talk, talk, talk. I wish you talk, talk, talk. You are not talk. You are not talk. I am talk. I am talk. I talk every day. You talk every day. We talk. We talk. You talk. I am not tosh. Ha, shesh is tosh, I am not tosh. We shesh and I shesh, I shesh. Shesh, shesh, shesh is not. Shesh, I shesh ul cool. I shesh, I am ul cool. Shul, shu, you are there. Shul, mushul, you are cool. Uh, I am a prick. But not yours, you are mine. <laughs> but I am not yours. Mine is a prick because the prick. I am the prick. I am the prick. I am God in my prick. I am God in my prick. Yours is a prick, not mine. Not mine. I am a prick in his prick. I prick, prick, prick. You are a prick, but not the prick. I can prick, prick. You cannot prick a prick. I am not a prick in your prick. I am a prick in his prick. Show you. Show you. I am not show you. You are shoy, not mine in shoy. I am a shoy. You are not shoy. We are shoy, not not shoy, 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 not shoy. Yeah, I am not shoy in a scaly skin. I am shoy. I am a shoy, 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 but not oi. Oi is intelligence, but not mine. I am intelligencing. I love mine. Is the intelligence in the shoy intelligence? I am shoy. I love. Shoy, 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 not scaly skin. I am God, not in a scaly skin. A scaly skin is intelligence in shoy. I am shoy. I am shoy. I want to write a lot to you, but I cannot work with you. For your aims are different. I know that you know how to pretend. I don't like to pretend. I like pretense when a person wants the good of others. You are a spiteful man, but you are not king. I am. You're not my king. I am your king. You wish me harm, I do not wish harm. You're a spiteful man, but I I'm a lullaby. Rock a bye 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 bye. Sleep in peace, rock a bye bye. Bye bye bye. Man to man. Vaslav Nijinsky.
I don't think I have anything to say. <laughs> so we're just going to set up chairs here. Many thanks. I know I speak for all of you to Paul for reading for us. And um, we're going to now have a conversation about some of what was just said. Are we moving one over, further over? That's good. I'm not going to introduce people because you have everything in your program and I don't want to take the time. So you know who these people are, right? Larry Wolf, Daryl Pinkney, Joan Acachella. Please uh, welcome them and uh, we, we can begin. So what I asked people to do here tonight was um, I thought we would just hear from each of them, uh, first Joan, and then talking a little bit about Nijinsky and his life, since she is the person who knows the most about this probably in the world. Daryl talking something about the production and his experiences, and then Larry talking to us a little bit about the broader background and, and history, and then we will have a conversation between us and uh, hopefully it will be very interesting. <laughs> so, Joan, why don't you go ahead? Um, wait a minute, I'm gonna turn on my thing. Um, well, there was a wonderful reading and I wanna remind you that the man who wrote it, uh, wrote those words, was having a psychotic break. Um, so, uh, and he was at that time writing through the night. Um, and so I think probably at four o'clock in the morning, that is how it went through his brain. Also the, the sexual material in the first one, um, uh, uh, I don't know a lot of schizophrenics, but according to the textbooks, uh, a sense of sexual sin is, is quite common. As common as the wordplay in the third selection. Um, and, uh, oh, and the grandiose plans for the, the saving of the earth. So it is important in reading the diary. Um, oh, and obviously I don't know how to do this. Maybe you'll tell me when my time is up. I, I thought it would be a wonderful idea. <coughs> the, the, uh, um, but uh, and it's, it's really quite an experience to edit a book by somebody who is so uh, uh, full of grief and, and fear. As you heard, he thinks at times that he can save the earth and that he's God. And then at other times he knows, or he fears and he knows that he's going to be put in an insane asylum soon, which was accurate. He was quite soon. Um, all right. Uh, so, um, as Jennifer said, Nijinsky was born in either 1889 or 1890. Uh, his sister and the gravestone disagree. Um, and he was the child of Polish dancers in those days. Um, and in some countries still, uh, dancing was a family thing. Um, uh, the, he grew up on the road. Uh, the parents, when they went to the theater, uh, uh, would lock the children in the hotel room. Um, and the children played these, these very often theater games. They would make up theater. Um, there's a, a sister, Bronislava, there's Nizhinsky, and then there's Stanislav. Stanislav, when he was three years old, fell out of a window onto a cobble stone drive and he was never right afterwards and um, they put him they, they finally put him in an institution um, when he was a teenager um, Nijinsky was very much afraid of the other children in the institution when they went to to visit um, the father abandoned the family I, 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 it's going to go on like this it was just a train of tragedies um, the father abandoned the family when his mistress got pregnant, um, uh, and that's, uh, Nizhinsky was eight years old. 
um, uh, father left, and the mother, Eleonora, moved to St. Petersburg and through connections, um, got Nijinsky into the Imperial School. Um, he was nine years old. Uh, he was very quickly recognized as a, 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 a remarkable prodigy. Um, he had no talent for any of his school subjects. Uh, his sister did his homework. Um, the only thing that he managed to pass was, uh, well, ballet and religion. Um, uh, the, um, he joined the Mariinsky Ballet, which we call the Kirov, but we're supposed to start calling it the Mariinsky again. Uh, he joined it at the age of 18, skipping uh, the introductory level of corps de ballet. He became a soloist and once again was instantly recognized. There was never a period of obscurity for Nishinsky. Um, although I don't know whether there ever is a period of obscurity for a dancer on that level. Uh, he had uh, such extraordinary skills. Um, the older ballerinas fought to have this 18-year-old boy partner them. Um, so um, in, in those days, and maybe in some countries still, uh, dancers supplemented their incomes by informal concubinage and, um, uh, and uh, people, you know, uh, wealthy men went to the ballet and uh, to pick out boyfriends and girlfriends. Um, Nijinsky went through a few lovers, uh, male, all male, uh, to my knowledge, um, very much encouraged by his mother, who did not want him to get married, and who very much appreciated the um, increase in income uh, from Nijinsky's being with counts and, and princes. Um, in 1908, uh, when Nijinsky was um, about 20, uh, 19, he met Sergei Diaghilev, um, who was about 17 years older than he was. It's an important fact. Uh, Diaghilev was 17 years older and um, uh, already a somewhat famous man. Um, he was a very much a leader of the arts, young arts in St. Petersburg. Um, he met him. Uh, he told Nijinsky to come around to his hotel room the next day. Or according to Nijinsky's diary, uh, he was told to come around to the hotel room the next day. He did. He was bedded and hired. Um, uh, Diagula was planning to take a troupe of dancers to Paris. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and he hired, he very wisely hired Nijinsky to... Um, uh, to come with him. Um, the, uh, Nijinsky didn't at that time cease to be a dancer with the Mariinsky Ballet, but Diaghilev, what seems to, uh, he was soon fired uh, two years later um, uh, in, uh, in 1911 for wearing an improper costume. All of Nijinsky's life was accompanied by scandal. He was an extremely, actually extremely modest, and I don't even know how sexual a man, um, but uh, but his whole <clears throat> his whole life was scandal. Anyway, he was uh, fired for wearing improper costume, and the the theater administration thought that they'd uh, patch it all back together the next day. But no, um, Diaghilev was now in charge of Nijinsky, and Nijinsky was going to be with him. Um, the company that Diaghilev formed, uh, completely altered the history of classical ballet in the West. Um, classical ballet was pretty much, uh, um, dead is the wrong word, but it was extremely calcified. And uh, as one woman said, um, the snobs sent their servants to the ballet on their birthdays, um, probably with the children. Um, but um, uh, Diaghilev made uh, ballet experimental uh, with young artists with good sets in music. He discovered uh, artists such as Nijinsky, such as Stravinsky. So, um, and, and in some measure, no, no, not in some measure, Diaghilev saved classical ballet. 
Um, and Nijinsky was a big part of that. Um, when Nijinsky arrived uh, in Paris in 1909, um, the people in Paris had never seen a, a great or even uh, probably masterful male ballet dancer. Uh, they had seen very competent and probably somewhat exciting female ballet dancers in probably extremely corny and fusty old productions, but never a man. Um, <clears throat> uh, once again, there was a note of scandal, and it helped create a great deal of excitement. And Nijinsky looked um, uh, foreign, to very, he looked tartar to them. In school, the kids called him Jap. Um, the, um, and also, Nijinsky lived openly with Diaghilev, which was an extremely unusual situation. Um, the, um, and the ballets that the house choreographer, Michel Fokin, made for Nijinsky um, very often featured some sort of sexual uh, off-centeredness. Uh, he was not a man, necessarily. He was a, a slave of you know, indeterminate uh, gender, or he was a rose, or he was a, a narcissist who falls in love with himself. He was never just, um, he was never uh, just a man. Um, his most famous roles in the early years were Scheherazade. You, you probably all know these ballets. Scheherazade, uh, where he wears, he's the golden slave, and he's, uh, uh, um, uh, what the French call cher à plaisir. He was uh, uh, like a yum yum. He was a uh, you know. He, he was. Is my time up? Almost. Uh, all right. Um, shoot. Okay. Um, we're going to have to get rid of that. The yeah. The uh, uh, all right. He became very famous in the Fokine ballets. Um, uh, the uh, uh, and. Okay, and, uh, uh, but truly, do you want me to stop? No. Uh, no. Like two yeah, minutes, three minutes, just tell me. Two, two, one minute? Okay, good enough. So, but I'm telling, I'm getting to the important part, which, which is really, really the important part, because um, those, a lot, most of those ballets look a little corny to us now. Uh, the ones that have survived are Petrushka, uh, in which he was very uh, great, apparently, and that's where people saw his apparently utterly extraordinary acting skills. Forget the dancing skills, uh, but uh, he had an ability, it seems, to become, to sink into the role and become emblematic uh, of the emotion. Um, and then, of course, his technical skills were utterly remarkable. He, uh, his sister, speaks of entre chats which is the beats, but 12 of them before coming down. It's his sister, um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and also what he was very famous for was his jump, uh, which was not only high, but had great ballon, which is lightness and ability to stay up. Um, and, uh, um, but the what is so important to us now is that Diaghilev encouraged Nijinsky to become a choreographer. And um, he made four ballets, um, uh, only one of which survives, uh, The Afternoon of a Fawn, and, uh, and survives in a beautiful state. It still looks beautiful. It doesn't look like a, uh, something that we took out of a museum and put up in front of people. Uh, OK. Um, uh, <laughs> no, well, one minute. Uh, the, uh, uh, after the Rite of Spring in 1913, um, Nijinsky, w the company went on tour to South America. Diaghilev did not go with them. And Nijinsky, two weeks out of port, married a groupie of the Ballet Russe um, who had attached herself to the company. Uh, Diaghilev then fired Nijinsky. I've heard many people say that uh, Diagula was a terrible man to have done such a thing. And I always say to them, if your boyfriend went on tour and two weeks out of port married somebody, 
wouldn't you fire him? Um, they, um, but, uh, but in any case, it was the end for Nijinsky. Um, the, uh, um, he later went back into the company, went back out, went back in, went back out, but uh, his mental state very much uh, deteriorated year by year. Um, finally, he went, uh, he and his wife moved to Switzerland at the very end of 1917 to, to wait out the war. And for about one year, uh, Nijinsky day by day fell apart. Um, he threw his wife down the stairs holding their daughter. He drove his sled into somebody else's sled. He went down to town with a big cross on his chest and told people to go to church. And he wrote that diary. Um, he wrote it in six weeks, six and a half weeks. Um, he wanted to write much more, but his wife said, Vasov, <clears throat> there's a nice nerve doctor in Zurich that I'd like you to see. And, uh, and he went with her. As the diary ends, he says, I'm packing up these notebooks so that I can get them published in Zurich, and I'm going to this nice nerve doctor. And, and that's the end. The nerve doctor was a psychiatrist, a famous psychiatrist, Eugen Bleuler, the man who invented the term schizophrenia in 1911. And he declared Nijinsky an incurable schizophrenic. He advised Romola to divorce him, which she did not do. Um, uh, and uh, he was put in an institute. He, they went back to the hotel. He locked himself in his room, wouldn't come out. Finally. Uh, Ramla called the, or, or no, I'm sorry, we don't know who called the police. Ramla says she didn't call the police, um, that her father-in-law did it. Um, the, uh, uh, the police broke down the door. Nijinsky was taken to an institution and very shortly was throwing furniture and, and fell apart. And he, they never put him back together again. He was what is called a chronic schizophrenic, which is basically a kind of quiet, sitting in the corner schizophrenic. Uh, for the next 30 years until he died at the age of 60 uh, f from liver failure. Okay, a very sad story. Daryl and I are going to trade, trade places, Good. if that's okay. Um, I'm a European cultural historian. I'm going to talk a little bit about the European cultural historical context for the diary. I wanted to start with Sigmund Freud. Um, in the 1920s, when psychoanalysis was huge and Nijinsky was a mental patient, it was widely supposed that he must have been in analysis with Freud at some point. And someone writes to Freud about it, and Freud writes back a letter um, denying it. Freud writes, Sehr geehrte Fräulein, very proper. Your letter gives me occasion for a warning which you certainly will find valuable. Namely, never believe something just because it is in the newspapers. <laughs> in reality, I have never seen the dancer Nijinsky and I have never had anything to do with his case. So I want to ask why it would have seemed plausible that Freud was involved with Nijinsky's case, so much so that it needed to be emphatically denied in writing in the 30s. Um, how can we think of Nijinsky first alongside of Freud and the culture of modernism? Well, 1913, Nijinsky helps to create the Rite of Spring. It's a landmark of European cultural modernism, or the landmark of European cultural modernism, perhaps. It's about violence. It's about sacrifice. It's about the primitive. I mean, we've already referenced that. 1913, Freud publishes Totem and Taboo, Resemblances Between the Psychic Lives of Savages and Neurotics, which is about the suppression of violent and sexual instincts in primitive society and culture parallel. 1911, Nijinsky is a huge success in Fokin's Specter of the Rose. He's Eros jumping in through the window into the sleeping consciousness of a girl. It could be a page out of Freud's interpretation of dreams. 1912, Nijinsky's Afternoon of a Fawn right, concludes simulating masturbation. Masturbation, which Freud had already envisioned as part of the polymorphous perversity of all of our sexual formations in the famous three essays. So these are some parallels for thinking about Nijinsky's career in ballet alongside Freud's career in psychoanalysis. But Nijinsky was actually part 
of the world of Central European modernism. We, of course, think of him as Russian by his training, Polish by his family origins, always think of him in the context of Paris and French culture because of the Ballet Russe. However, he is also, and especially by marriage, part of the Austro-Hungarian world of Central European culture. His, Hungar his Hungarian wife, Romola Dopolsky, was the daughter of a famous Hungarian actress, Amelia Marcus, who actually comes up in the drama. Uh, that is, um, I understand war because I fought with my mother-in-law. Um, but it's not just that Nijinsky has a Hungarian wife. Hungary becomes, in some sense, his default home with Romola, more and more his guardian as well as his wife. From 1914, when war breaks out, Nijinsky is a Russian enemy alien in Austria-Hungary under house arrest in Budapest. Um, in the most important connection to Central Europe, though, is through the Swiss, German, Austrian, and Hungarian world of psychiatry and medicine. He's at the Swiss Bellevue Sanatorium from 1919 at Kreuzlingen on Lake Constance. And this already begins to connect him to the world of Freud's Vienna and the history of psychiatry. It's actually a totally interesting transitional moment in the history of psychiatry with the sanatorium as a phenomenon of the turn of the century, just like cultural modernism. And in fact, it becomes a totem of cultural modernism when Thomas Mann in the 20s writes the novel The Magic Mountain about a tuberculosis sanatorium. The history of psychiatry is an evolution from the world of the hospital and the asylum in the 19th century to the new world of sanatoriums, spas, um, private consulting rooms and couches, and the new world of modern chemical and pharmaceutical treatment, which in the case of Nijinsky meant insulin shock treatment. Nijinsky was in some ways a victim of this transitional moment in the treatment of mental illness. The uncertainty over how to deal with mental illness. Psychiatry was becoming a 20th century profession built on posh sanatoriums and private therapy. Romola is taking him from one sanatorium to another, confining him, emancipating him, taking him home, putting him back in, looking for a therapist, looking for another therapist. How could he not have been analyzed by Freud? Right? No wonder Freud has to issue a statement in 1933. In the early 1920s, however, in Vienna, Nijinsky is actually treated at the Steinhoff Sanatorium by doctors from the University of Vienna, from Freud's world. Now, the Steinhoff Sanatorium is itself a work of Central European cultural modernism. You can picture it. It's Otto Wagner's gold-domed sanatorium church. It's been on every poster for every exhibit about fin de siècle Vienna that we've had since the 1980s. It was completed in 1907, the same year that Klimt painted the portrait of Adel Blochbauer, the woman in gold, uptown at the Neue Galerie, and the same year as Joan mentioned, 1907, when Nijinsky graduates and joins the company of the Imperial Ballet in St. Petersburg. He, too, is a sort of creation of the modernist moment. And his psychiatric treatment at the Steinhoff Sanatorium connects him again to that world of Viennese modernism. Now, his mental illness emerges during the course of World War I, years when we can say the whole world went mad. Ongoing four years of mass murder, 17 million deaths, 20 million wounded. The diary shows that Nijinsky is very, very aware of the war and its headlines. Psychiatry and psychoanalysis are very engaged with the war. Freud, for sure, but famously W.H.R. Rivers in Scotland, who is prescribing talk therapy for shell shock. We can even think of the catatonic schizophrenia of Nijinsky, who refuses to communicate as in some ways resembling the shell shock that everyone was thinking about at that moment during the war. Um, shell shock seen by some as a psychiatric defense, as a psychic defense against the horrors of war. And these horrors of war also make a huge impression on Nijinsky, right? The drama begins, Yapani Mayovoinu, I understand war. And as Jennifer said, he actually is trying to dance the war. Um, the mental collapse in the years of the war Probably not a coincidence. One of the things I thought was totally fascinating about the diary is the story of Nijinsky and Wilson, and I don't mean Robert Wilson, I mean Woodrow Wilson. Um, the war has not stopped because men think, writes Nijinsky. I know how the war can be stopped. Wilson 
Woodrow Wilson wants to stop the war, but people do not understand him. If Wilson wanted to, again, he could abolish money. If he does not want to abolish money, he will not be able to understand God. I understand God and therefore will help Wilson in his tasks. So it's Wilson actually repeatedly who comes up in the diary showing us that Nijinsky is actually part of the messianic European idea of Wilson, the cult of Wilson, fighting the war to end wars to bring a new kind of peace based on the self-determination of peoples. And Nijinsky is obsessed not only with Christ and Tolstoy and Diaghilev, but also unexpectedly with Woodrow Wilson, focused on the headlines of the day, the fighting and the ending of the war, the traumatic war, which is traumatic for Europe, but also individually for Nijinsky. It brings on the moment of his psychic breakdown and coincides with the collapse of reason in Europe, the moment when going crazy could almost be the same thing to do. Romola is looking for asylum, literally, for Nijinsky during World War I, and she's looking for asylum again during World War II, because there is a World War II story connected to Nijinsky as well. He lives until 1950. She brings him home to Budapest in 1914, at the beginning of World War I, and she brings him home to Budapest again in 1940 at the beginning of World War II. And it's not actually a great place to be or to experience those wars. Nijinsky lives with her family first after 1940 in Nazi-allied Hungary under the government of Admiral Horthy, and then Nazi-occupied Hungary after 1944. They're there at the moment when Adolf Eichmann is organizing the deportation of the Hungarian Jews, who are actually dangerous to Romola's family because her, her stepfather was a, hung, um, was a Hungarian convert from Judaism. But this is a climate that's also super dangerous to Nijinsky himself because of the Nazi policy on euthanasia for the mentally ill. Murder of patients in sanatoriums is taking place all over Nazi Europe, and including the beautiful Steinhof Sanatorium in Vienna. We actually now know this. Um, it's not just a work of cultural modernism, but a site of Nazi atrocities during the war. Nijinsky actually barely escapes being put to death in an asylum um, by Nazi euthanasia policy as the war is ending in Hungary. After the war, he's a homeless, displaced person, one of millions, but the one who happens to have been the most famous dancer of the early 20th century. Thinking about the diary in relation to World War I, thinking about Nijinsky in relation to World War II, you want to keep in mind that he lived through the most horrific years of the 20th century. And one of the interesting things about the diary is that it also offers a perspective from the very particular moment of 1919, looking out on a whole European world that has just come through four traumatic years of war. Here's what Sigmund Freud writes. We cannot but feel that no event has ever destroyed so much that is precious in the common possessions of humanity, confused so many of the clearest intelligences, or so thoroughly debased what is highest. It tramples in blind fury on all that comes in its way, as though there were to be no future and no peace among men after it's over. Freud and Nijinsky lived through the same war in Central Europe. It was shattering for both their worlds, the world of the psychoanalyst and the world of the mental patient, even if they never actually met. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, everything you see on stage is the answer to a formal problem that the theater, the stage, has presented to him. Um, 
I remember as a student in the 70s, this incredible Russian guy defected in Canada and was going to appear in New York. We waited in line for an hour and a half. I remember Barishnikov hanging in the air. And one of the first rehearsals, he said, oh, I can't jump like that. And he was talking about the photograph of uh, Nijinsky as an old man jumping straight up against a wall. He said, I could never jump like that. Always needed a running start. And I looked at his wife, and he looked back, and we thought, OK, fine, anything you say. And there's a very famous moment in a documentary where uh, Barishnikov begins with his legs crossed, and he goes straight up in the air from a standing position, no running or anything like that. So he could do everything, well, he could do everything that no dancer in a long time had been able to do. For He resisted for a long time offers to play Nijinsky. He just didn't want to. Um, I don't think anyone on earth other than Barishnikov could know what Nijinsky felt uh, just because his own mastery uh, is at such a sort of high and original and individual level. Um, so it sort of seemed a kind of perfect moment. I remember that Elizabeth Harvard once said that all the work of Virginia Woolf seems mad to her because it gives a sense of being all soliloquy. And the thing that makes Nijinsky's diaries, to me, casework but not literature, is the language. It's all declarative sentence, I, 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 I. It's part of the heartbreak of the work, uh, is its isolation. He had Russian, but even his Russian was not very good. It was a kind of Polish Russian. But there's no French, there's no Hungarian, there's no English. So he's already, when he's lost Yagolev, living in a new kind of isolation. Uh, that, for me, is what the diaries are about. He's leaving crumbs uh, back to himself, almost, uh, sort of as he's losing himself. And so it presents a problem of how to stage them. Uh, but of course, uh, you're doing it with one guy, uh, one man. So the burden is on him all the time. You're going to be thinking or looking at this one performer all the time. And the fact that it's this one guy isolated on stage, that in itself covers the diary form, because there you have sort of the eye. But the diary tells a story in a very long and indirect way that can't be staged, in, and that Wilson has no interest in staging. He doesn't do biopics, in case you didn't know. Uh, uh, but he can think in textures, and that's what the diary has, textures of light and dark. It has moods. And so what Wilson did was try to kind of think of the structure of the piece in terms of the textures and the moods, light, dark, fast, slow, and uh, these kind of basic blocks built up a very elaborate frame. Uh, it takes Robert Wilson three hours to light three minutes on a good day. And the whole point is for you to see something that looks effortless and not guess how much work went into it. So he gives this frame for Barishnikov to find his Nijinsky. And he found it in a very subtle way. And for all of Nijinsky's attempts to appear worldly and in command in the diaries, they're really full of his innocence. And they're full of his own heartbreak. And even though he was a straight guy, uh, he had this great love affair with Diaghilev. And the end of it shocked him and shocked Diaghilev, and in some ways changed their lives and certainly sort of wrecked um, the Jenskys. But Barishnikov found the innocence of this genius, and in some ways is dancing with that. He dances throughout the piece with Nijinsky's innocence and finds a kind of idiom that's not the ballet, but it is about movement and needing to be in motion in order to express himself, in order to think, really. So the lights move, the stage moves, the sets move. Everything is always in motion uh, because one rule of Robert Wilson is you have to see something happening all the time. And this is what, in some ways, the piece is about, um, but it is Barishnikov in some ways, yeah. It's his own love letter to Nijinsky, as Nijinsky remembers this love letter to uh, Diaghilev. And it was Barishnikov's idea to set the piece in 1945, so that you're very far removed from the dancing career. 
And what you have left is this artist who cannot reclaim or save himself. Uh, and maybe some of you know how that feels, maybe not, but we see it. Okay, thank you all very much. Um, you know, I just um, I was hoping to just start the conversation with um, something that occurred to me, especially as Paul was reading, which is that I always think of Nijinsky as somebody who is silent, and that's because I think I think of him as a dancer, and so I, and I also think of him as somebody who arrived in Europe with none of the languages that were around him and who depended almost entirely on Diaghilev and others to help him make his way. And so I mean, it's very striking to me that this man who lived and in a world of, in some ways, silence, he danced in silence, not without music, but without voice, words. And then he goes on to create this document that is all words and a very deep involvement with words and language. So that that is something I was hoping that we might be able to talk about. The other thing that is sort of related to that that seems to me extremely sort of to be coming out here is the, the side, I mean, Larry, in a way, you're saying that it was almost sane for him to go insane in the context that he lived. And Joan, you're saying insane is tragic and insane. Yeah, he, and, he, and I, I think he was insane. Right. But, uh, you know, what interests me about that also is that the, ba the dances themselves had a kind of quality of sane and insane, at least from the descriptions we have of them, which is that there's something that I see in the diaries, too, which is he's so removed, he can move outside of himself and watch himself going insane. Yes. In a kind of clinical way, almost. And then he can sort of re-enter the insanity and be in it. And, and the dances have that kind of cold clinical quality, too, at least the descriptions, especially of the Rite of Spring by Jacques Riviere and others. And there's something very, very rational about it, about its expression of irrationality. So, you know, I'm sort of wondering what, what the rest of you think about that. I just that. want to add one footnote to something that Larry said about Nijinsky's languages, it's true that he didn't, he didn't have good Russian. Um, and the translator of, of the diary complained of this bitterly. Um, um, the, uh, but also- were, were they written in Russian or in Polish? Russian. 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 Um, but his Russian. His Russian. His Russian, which was not good. And I translated the French letters, and believe me, his French is not good. <laughs> but uh, I just want to make the point that when he married Romola, they had no language in common. Um, um, so, what you said about a silent man um, is true. In is fact. true. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they found ways to communicate, but I think mime came into it. You know, the um, uh, he lived a very um, the you know the sort of going theory of schizophrenia for for many years now has been the diathesis stress theory, which is that you have a genetic predisposition, you have a genetic load, as they say, but stress must come into it, difficult. If your life is easy, if, if it, it, not easy, but if you can have a decent lot, if you have well, decent that's Larry's parents. that's point, right? Here exactly. we are with... But, but nothing worked out for him. Uh, and uh, according to his best biographer, his mother was deeply depressed. I told you the father abandoned the family under really, you know, sort of, I don't know, scandal circumstances. Or there's scandals to me in any case. Nothing worked out for him, but he had some of the great accomplishments and. It, well, you I know, mean, it kind of makes you want to cry, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he really did um, uh, 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 sublimate, to use a Freudian term. Uh, um, he created these great things, or at least one great thing, the afternoon of the fawn, and then he fell silent for 30 years. I mean, you know, he was crushed. And his period of, as a choreographer is so brief that that's part of the tragedy. Yeah, 
yes, it's 1912 to 1916, so it's four years. I mean, really mean people um, say that even the best artists have basically 10 to 15 years <laughs> of really, no, of really wonderful work. Well, I mean, most people, most, including very good artists, have about two or three ideas. Um, and uh, uh, they can work them in many different ways and so forth. But, you know, not everybody, I mean, there are, of course, freakish exceptions to this. Ba George Balanchine, yes. Picasso, Stravinsky, um, certain other people. Uh, actually, in, in some sense, uh, Sigmund Freud. Um, but most, uh, as a person who's reviewed very good artists for uh, 35 years, really, you know, the, be the best ones... Uh, Fifteen years uh, <laughs> of, of oh dear of, uh, of, <laughs> of, of top work. To I'm talking top work, um, and then there's the build up to that, and then there's the the long build down from that. Um, and but in Nijinsky's case, it's a sharp falling well, off the Nijinsky edge. Well, Nijinsky had only four years. He didn't have to, you know, uh, peter out. And there are a lot of reasons why he has only four years, but one of them is that the war comes in 1914, and Nijinsky is not the, is not the only cultural moment that is cut short in 1914. But, there are a whole set of European cultural trajectories that are, cut, that are cut short yeah. in 1914. I mean, it's a turning point in history for lots and lots of reasons. On the subject of language, um, I mean, we say uh, strange, strange Russian, strange French, I would say, as the person who, as the PhD advisor for all the graduate students working on East European history at NYU, that if you've ever tried to learn Hungarian, <laughs> as many of my graduate students have, it's the hardest one of all. It's not related to Russian or Polish or German or French or English. And it's not an Indo-European language. It's it, no, it's, it's no, not. It's a, no, it's a Finno-Ugric language. And so to put, place him in a Hungarian context repeatedly, That's someone even who is more anyway isolated. Tra traumatized by language, perhaps, is probably to increase that trauma as well. But I would say, we talked about this before, right? the question of the literary merits of the diary. Um, I understand that it has lots of faults. Um, but Well, things that prevent it from being read as literature, and you, you sort of you know, enunciated it pretty clearly, but you actually made a work of drama out of it that kind of works as a, as a, piece, as a piece of literature on stage. And Paul reading the letters up front kind of works, right? As, and you can believe in them as a literary creation. So I think that for someone whose language skills are pretty stunted and someone whose pathology was the inability to speak, that the diary is actually pretty expressive. No, I agree with you. I think it's, well, Certainly go ahead. They are, but the, you know, that Museum of Mad People's artwork in Lausanne, the, yeah. uh, it's the repetitive circles yeah. of the diaries themselves and you know, the, the kind of um, attitudes, uh, it remains a document more than anything. If you read the diaries next to Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky achieves what Nijinsky can't, which is dramatic irony. Mm -hmm. uh, we know something, the narrator speaking in, di in the notes from Underground or Diary of a Madman, which, what am I thinking of, Gogol or Dostoevsky? Yeah. Yeah. Your notes from Underground is good yeah. enough. Oh, okay. Diary of a Madman is that, you know, he's going nuts. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't know. Whereas Nijinsky, That's he does know. That's the story of Mad Men. I'm sorry. Yeah, he, he does, does know, know it. it. And mm -hmm. struggle. So the book, the document, the diaries are very moving as a struggle. And this thing happening before our eyes and happening before his eyes. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a mistake to make claims for them that don't need to be made. Our interest in them is real. Uh, and, uh, and the humanity of them is very real. Uh, but given the great art he created, uh, you know, we don't have to then try to make him something he's not. No, but I do think that you can see a certain quality of the imagination. No. No, you don't think so? No. Quality of his mind in them? No. Because it does uh, relate to the dances a bit. I think you're really loading the dice if you compare him to Dostoevsky. That is <laughs> one of the greatest writers in no, our tradition. I mean, the effect you can get <laughs> You know, the, 
Dramatic irony belongs to the stage, not to narrative literature. But for Gogol to be able to give a narrative piece dramatic irony says something to the consciousness at which he's working with language. Mm -hmm. Nijinsky doesn't have that. It's transcription of experience, transcription of emotion. He's a very powerful and dynamic and intriguing and complex guy. All of that comes across even as he's falling apart. Uh, but let me, well, I don't want to argue over what's actually a semantic or minor mm -hmm. point. We're talking about this great life. One thing I want to say is I remember someone said, choreographers are the meanest people on earth. <laughs> <laughs> they are really <laughs> terrible people. And you don't feel that about Nijinsky at all. You really don't. Uh, you know, uh, no, no, you feel a certain, what would you say? Uh, kind directors are tyrants, yeah. and you feel yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Why do you think that he wrote the letter to Diaghilev? Oh, um, I'll take that one. one <laughs> yeah, uh, you, can't, you can't what? You cannot one-up someone who has dumped you. Yeah. Um, so I mean, he's really trying to sort of explain it, get it back, blame him, apologize, say, can't we try again? Don't you think he's so still in love with him? No, I think he misses. I don't think he was ever in love with him. I think he misses that life. Yeah. That when he chose Romel over Diagla, it was artistic suicide. Yeah. I agree but with that. There, there are 14 letters in the diary. He had a lot of people on his mind. I don't know whether you've ever been sick uh, or had to be in bed for five days or something like this. He was very isolated, and there were a lot of people he wanted to like set it straight. There's a letter to his mother. There's a letter to... Uh, a pianist, uh, there's a letter to Jean Cocteau, a letter to Monsieur Serre. He had a lot of f f fish to fry. Um, <laughs> and the letter to Diaghilev is certainly the most important. Uh, I think it's also the longest. Uh, and, uh, and, and in many ways, very thrilling. You, you heard um, uh, Paul beautifully handling the wordplay there. That wordplay is partly um, a symptom of schizophrenia, clanging, the rhyming, and there are made up words in there. Some of the words you didn't understand, the reason you didn't understand them is they don't exist, you know. Right. But, um, but other times he's doing puns, he's doing, um, uh, he's doing rhymes that you don't understand because my, uh, the translator has translated the word. Right. So woodpecker is not what. Nijinsky said, he said, Rommel, you know. Um, um, the, uh, but you see him trying to get mastery over language. And let me add that Diaghilev was one of the most elegant, most well-spoken, most, um, uh, he had everything that Nijinsky wanted. Um, sophistication, education, taste, you know. Um, and, uh, and Nijinsky did not. I, don't see, I, I would agree with you, Jennifer. I don't see how you can read the letter or hear the letter and doubt that it's a love letter. A dump lover, love letter, but to me at least unequivocally a love letter. Yeah. Well, he's saying I made a mistake, but you made one too. Uh, but he's not sort of saying the things you would say to a lover when you cast aside your pride and say, I can't go on, I miss you, how could you throw this away, can't we try again, I see that I made a big mistake with my wife. Oh, you know, Daryl. So <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you would? <laughs> uh, but it doesn't have any of that. He's not saying anything. No, but he's, he's more engaged. He's, it's, these are the, it he's seems to me it's to the conversation. Yeah, exactly. He's still trying to win, so there's he's, two guys. Yeah. And they always were two guys going at it in this kind of s and way of who's going to be in control. Uh, so that um, brings me to a question of the, of the sort of presence of sex in these diaries in a way that is, um, I'm wondering whether there's, a, whether there's also a, a, a pull from earlier Russian traditions. I'm thinking of Solovyev and the the ideas that there's something about sex that is, if you if you 
if you don't have it as much, you might be able to actually add to a kind of religious transfiguration of the world. I mean, it sounds to us kind of crazy, but they really were thinking like that when Nijinsky was growing up and when he was in St. Petersburg, and there, this was very widely ex, you know, thought about and discussed view. So I'm wondering whether his sort of constant tension and conflict and guilt and uh, attraction to, I mean, you see this in some of the those other literary figures. Um, can I say, I don't think it was said that Nijinsky has converted in his mind to Tolstoyan um, right. uh, philosophy, and which means that he's practicing vegetarianism, vegetarianism and what he calls marital chastity, um, which uh, did not please his wife, who then had an affair with his doctor. Um, the, um, um, but uh, he says uh, in the letter that, uh, that Paul Giamatti read um, that uh, 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 he's, you know, he, he has this very great thorn in his brain over sex. And um, um, uh, actually, my sense of Nijinsky after very many years is that he was a person who actually was not that interested in sex. Is that right? Yes, um, and and as um, uh, Daryl said, um, it's pretty clear to me that Nijinsky's all of Nijinsky's instincts were heterosexual. He's been held up; he was held up for many years as a homosexual saint and a martyr to homosexuality. But it's not true. He did what he had to do, you know. He did what he had to do, but when he didn't have to do, when he was free for the afternoon. Or when he was having, <laughs> when he, or when he was having fantasies, it was always a woman. Yes, he, yes, uh, he says that in in it's Wilson's play. Uh, I he says I, I chased, you know, I spent many many um, uh, days in Paris chasing tarts, uh, uh, as it's translated. But he really did uh, spend a lot of time with prostitutes, female prostitutes. I mean, I would has. I would hesitate over it just because the relationship with Diaghilev seems very clearly to me to be a great romance, a very troubled romance, um, but a romance nevertheless. Oh, but all right. I'm on sorry. Both, on I, both I, sides? I think, you know, if I had reason to, if I were in prison or, you know, I mean, he, he had reason to love Diaghilev. And I think Diaghilev must have seemed to him an extremely glamorous character. And Nijinsky was whatever you say his his wishes were or his uh, whatever he was in fact bisexual. I mean, you know, I, I do think these things should, in the end, sort of be defined by what you're doing as opposed to what Dr. Freud thinks you are. Um, but well, he, uh, he wouldn't have been the only one. I mean, his mother didn't think there was anything unusual about handing him along to church with this kind of guy who showed up. Uh, the whole milieu was that way. In the, some ways, his interest in prostitutes in Paris was seeking out too. Yes, um, th very good. You know, they're class things. There are class things going on yes, here. Yes, very much. And um, um, uh, Eleonora Nijinsky did not want Nijinsky to get married at all. Uh, she needed his financial support, and uh, but I mean. These are people who are kind of scraping it together. And he was very, um, he was, everything was paid for by Diaghilev. He had no control of his own finances. He had no control of his He had no salary own, either. He had no salary. He had no way to control what came next or where he was going. I mean, really, the script was being written. His life was being written by by Diaghilev, and you do have a sense of a caged, there is something caged about yes, him. Yes, that's how Diaghilev did it, yes. There are people who only exist when they're doing their thing, and their problem is how to live once they're not on stage, once they're not in front of the camera, that's once they're not point. playing or singing, and, and it was no different for Nijinsky, and his total dependence on Diaghilev answers that. It's just that as a male, he resented sitting there in the restaurant as this kind of silent object of everyone Yes, and also there's something I'd like to mention here, although we can't go into it because it's too big a subject, but um, you mentioned Baryshnikov. 
I think that Nijinsky's fame was r really um, uh, in, uh, yeah, well, it was intense, but also it was uh, very upsetting. Um, I mean, his fame was, you know, like Boryshnikov's, except in a way worse. Um, he didn't have a car that he could drive off. People came into his dressing room and stole his underwear. Um, he was shy, right? He was, he was an extremely shy man. So, um, uh, which should be perfectly fine, right? Shouldn't it be? But he, people wanted to meet him. People like Lytton Strange, people who've written about this, you know, these fancy artistic people would want to take him out to dinner or have dinner with him. And he would sit there picking his cuticles and looking down at his dinner, you know? And they would go off and say, oh, he's such an idiot, you know? But of course he wasn't. He just wasn't Bloomsbury. Um, the, uh, uh, but I, I think that kind of fame can be very tough. He became, an, he became uh, not world famous, but West famous. Um, you know, at a very young age, 20, you know. Uh, uh, I don't know how they take it. Uh, Brushnikov was a little older when he came, when he was, although he was a pr pretty famous man in Russia before he came. But, um, but it was hard for Nizhinsky, and also don't forget, they're all looking at his body. Yeah. Um, you know, he's a young man, modest actually. And they want to go to bed with him. Yes, that's right, and, the, and a lot of so them the make... World is the, no, oh, and, and the, the men whom he was with, or the ones I know about, the three men before Dyaida, um, they were, uh, number one, nobility, uh, people with a great deal of money. Um, they, as I said, don't forget class. Um, he, he was nobody, except they all wanted him. Okay. <laughs> We're going to end there. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you to our panelists. And thank you to Paul Giamatti.